Hello everyone, welcome to Your Kids Next Read, welcome to the YKNR author talk with the amazing Melina Marquetta. Um, sorry about that small delay there. We had a bit of a tech issue as is the drama of our lives these days. I'm sure you'll all agree. Um, so I, my name is Alison Tate. I am one of the admins of the Your Kids Next Read group along with the wonderful Megan Daly and our wonderful Alison Rushby who I know is in the comments um, and is going to be helping us to you know wrangle things as they go along. So she is currently the comment wrangler, and that will be her official title from here on in. Um, now, one thing I'd like need to say is that we're using a program called StreamYard to run this event. Um, what we need you to do if, if you want us to be able to see who you are when you comment is just to click on the link above this video in the post. Um, if you click on the link, it gives StreamYard permission to see your name and your photo, and um, it will just allow us to know who it is that's actually talking to us. So um, it would be great if you can see us now if you can, um, if someone could just comment and like give us a wave, say hello, just let us know that you can hear and see us, that would be great. Um, anyone, hello, anyone? <laughs> Nobody's there. Hmm. I wonder if they're there or if, anyway, we'll go forward. Um, anyway, so I'm here with Melina Marquetta. Melina is an internationally best-selling and award-winning author in more than 20 countries and 18 languages. Her 11 book range from beloved young adult fiction, such as Looking for Ala Brandi, Saving Francesca, and On the Jellico Road, and fantasy through to contemporary and crime fiction. I don't know if any of you have read um, Melina's adult crime fiction, but I personally am a massive fan. And now, of course, books for younger readers, and that is what we're here to talk about tonight. We are going to be talking about the latest releases in her very brand new spanking junior mm -hmm. fiction series, brand new and spanking. Um, and the first book, uh, What Zola Did on Monday, here it is, holding it up, facing the camera, there it is, uh, came out earlier this year. And What Zola Did on Tuesday is going to be out um, next week, which is very exciting and excellent timing. So hello to everyone. Hi, Beck from Geelong. Hi, Adrian. Hi, Al. It's good to see you. We are not talking to no one, Melina. That's very good to hear, yeah. isn't it? Um, anyway, so welcome to our event. We're very excited to have you here tonight. Um, so I guess where I think we should start is for you to tell us a little bit about your new series. Tell us about what Zola did on every weekday. No, not really. Just tell us about well, the series. I'm a bit disappointed because, um, and I, and it's because of the, I'm sure it's because of what's happening in um, in Victoria, but I was promised a copy of Tuesday, what's all did on Tuesday three weeks ago, and it hasn't arrived yet. So I can't believe that you've got one and I haven't got I've one. Got so. your copy. <laughs> I'll send it to you. Uh, yeah, no, no, it's, but it's just I remember how excited um, you know someone from Penguin was about the fact that she was sending it out and I know that my editor who lives in Melbourne only received hers probably last Friday but I haven't received mine yet so um, Zola I mean you can hear her, I can hear her footsteps here's she is yes see this oh. little face okay oh. well, last time. this is the last time we can okay. so this is shh, you can't talk this is Bianca She's the inspiration for Zola. Um, <laughs> she knows that she is Zola, um, but we used another name. Um, and now you can go. Wait, Ma, for no. dessert, can I no, no, have no, 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 um, no. ice cream? I'll, we'll do dessert when I get off. Um, okay. Off. Bye. bye bye. Shut the door. Bye. Um, chat it, chat it, chat it. Okay. She'll be she'll be back. Trust me. Um, okay. So who? Um, the child you just met there, Bianca. Um, very reluctant reader, um, oh. just really um, struggled, especially when she was in first grade, with books, with words. Um, I struggled. I had no patience. Um, I struggled listening to her read. And I just became such an expert on um, a page, you know, what, how many words were on a page, how many blank spaces there were, how quickly the chapters ended and um, I, it all kind of started with that. I just thought I'd love to, you know, write something and I know there's there are a lot of books out there so I don't want to be one of those people, uh, you know, who say I didn't discover there was something missing until I had a child but there were a few things missing and I, I worked out when she was, you know, in year one that there were so many books for eight-year-olds and so many, you know, the picture books 
which of course kids are still reading, but the one thing they really start pushing, obviously, when they're in first grade is for them to start reading books that have a lot of words on the page and less yeah. pictures. Um, so, and at the same time, my editor, Amy, um, she had reread a book I had written 10 years ago for um, Puffin's 70th birthday, which was called The Gorgon in the Gully. And she said, you know, I really, I reread it. I really loved it. Have you ever thought of writing, a, you know, for that age group? And I actually think, you know, as much as people love The Gorgon, I actually think that I failed in understanding the audience and the language of it. Um, but any which way, I said no. I, I can't write. Can I just ask why you thought you failed with that? Was it was it too sophisticated? Was it like no? I guess I think yeah. the storyline is fun because it was based on my experience where I went to school. There was a gully, and we thought that there was something really quite bad at the bottom of the gully. So it was a fun story, but the language I used um, okay. it wasn't even sophisticated language, but it certainly wasn't language for a seven and eight year old especially a struggling one. So the one thing, you know, with Bianca that I realised is I had to write things phonetically. It's why I actually chose the name Zola because I think, okay, Zola, okay. it's the way it's written. So there were a lot of decisions like that, I, you know, making sure that the chapters weren't that long, that there was a simplicity to them, to the story, but there are a lot of things going on between the lines and I think that that's for the relationship between um, a reader and their parent or guardian. So I, I, I'd love to think that someone's reading it with their child and the question might be asked, for example, it's so obvious that um, her nonno has passed away, um, but the kids just say um, they miss him. So I think, you know, I'd love to think that someone's having a discussion with, you know, their child, why, you know, why are they missing him? Where is he? And that's a discussion for someone who might ask, but for someone who doesn't, I don't use the word death, you know, and it, for other things as well. So it's kind of writing it at a level where it can be as simple as possible, but I think that some of the issues can also be explored. Um, and that's so that's how it started. Was that so, like, that's a real challenge as, as an author to, to do that, like to create a story that is, you know, simple on one level, language is, is you know, relatively simple, but that there's more stuff going on because, I mean, we, you know, like you're not the only mum, parent, who's ever sat there with some of those school readers just going, oh, <laughs> what are we doing here? Um, yeah. So to create something that works on several levels is very difficult. How did you go about doing that? I found it really hard. I, it's just, you know, people don't believe this. They think, oh, she's just saying it and I don't think they think that. But um, I, I just find it really e not easy easier um, writing, you know, a, a novel, a full-length novel. I, I found it easier writing 80,000 words than I did, um, you know, 2,000 words because when you're writing for kids, and you would know this, every word has to count. It's why, mm -hmm. like, my dream would be to write a picture book one day and I always think it's almost like when I grow up and get better at writing, I will write a picture book because less is more and, it's one thing I realised with this Zola book that it has every word has to pack a punch, um, but it it also has to have that simplicity that a kid they you know I keep on saying this and I always go back to Bianca kids like her deserve a win in the classroom they don't get many wins um, no. they don't get picked she's a very dynamic child as you can see they don't get picked to read you know, at certain things. They don't get picked to do certain things. So they need a win when it comes to words. And, you know, getting to the end of a chapter was a win. Um, and, of course, her reading, you know, has, I mean, it. she's in third grade now and it has improved. She's not She's not um, passionate about reading, I have to say, um, yeah. but you can imagine that I'm not going to give up on it. And at the moment, without plugging another book, but, you know, the Babysitter Club on Netflix has changed our lives because yeah. she's obsessed with the Babysitter Club, which I think is a fantastic series, by the way. But, you know, we found the book and the deal is you read one chapter, you can watch it, you know. So she is yeah. getting through a book that is a lot harder than I would have imagined for her, but she's so into those girls that she will stay focused on it. So, um, and that's what you're constantly trying to do, as you would know, as a writer. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I guess also, um, you know, as a parent from that perspective, that kind of um, stands up to what we try to do in this group, which is essentially try to put the right book into the, into the you know, to the child's hands at the right time because um, that, you know, because my younger son is a very busy boy um, and he's less, uh, you know, of a reader than my older son and my way forward with him has always just been throwing books at him until something sticks. So I guess that what you're trying to create with Zola is a book that you can throw at a kid like that that might stick. Is that is that the kind of thing that you were looking to do? Yeah. Yes, I just, yeah. um, it, it has to, I, I'm exactly the same as you. I I won't give up, but I will accept that she's, she mightn't be interested in being a reader. But my thing is that just say one day something clicks, I need her to be prepared for that. So that's why I don't stop the reading every day. I mean, okay, I'm, there are days that we don't because, you know, we might be going out that night, but it's pretty much she has to read every day. And I even stopped getting, um, you know, getting hot and bothered about her finishing a book. It's now that she has to be reading because um, I think it's just really improving the skill so that if, you know, she in reading the Babysitter Club at the moment, um, she knows how to read that because there's been that persistent, you know, reading. I'm very jealous of people who, um, you know, there are a lot of the mums at school who'll say that, they get mad on their children because all they do is find books around. I think, oh, my God, um, I wish I could get mad on my child for that. But it is what it is and I don't want her to feel as if she's failing at something because she doesn't have that um, passion for books. Um, and it's not because I'm a writer. It's because, and I, I'm presuming anyone in this room, as in in this virtual room, will be the same as me, writing, reading has um, brought such solace in my life and I want that for her. I want her to be able to go to something, you know, at times when she's had problems, whatever, and and to find that solace. Um, and, of course, because of the fact that literacy is across the board when it comes to, you know, maths, it's all about, um, you know, solving a problem. So if, if she doesn't grasp how to do that. So Zola was a step for me. And, of course, she loves Zola because she knows that um, she's Zola. Um, my whole family, we, yeah. he, the um, dog hasn't thrown itself into the room, but um, the dogs in the story, one is called Gigi and Gigi's the dog next door um, or behind and their dog is Monty, whereas in real life our dog is Gigi and Monty's the dog next door. So um, so all those, well, everything's quite real in a way. Miss Divis, um, the teacher, is my next door neighbour who's a teacher. Um, and you know, we just have such a, um, a passionate um, kind of, you know, response to our children and our dogs that that's why that story is about children and dogs and children and dogs doing the wrong thing as well. So, um, yeah, so I don't have to really go far out to find these stories. It's interesting, though, too, because, um, you know, it's such a personal story. Like, as you said, you know, it's, you know the, the main character is based on your daughter, you've got the neighbour in there, the dogs are all in there. Um, but the key, of course, with a story like that is also to find uh, the universality in, isn't it? You, you, need to, you need to have a universal kind of appeal to it. So what do you think is the key to that? Look, I just think it's an accessible world. It's a real world. Um, but my, um, you know, when I, when I think of her neighbourhood and our neighbourhood, ours is very, it's very diverse. Actually, it's not diverse. It's a lot of Italians in my neighbourhood. Um, so, you know, that's one thing because I've kind of moved closer um, to where I grew up. And, um, you know, so for me it was always important that, um, you know, I'm a single mum and sadly, and it's an interest, I mean, when I think of, you know, the way fate goes. Um, when I started writing this novel, my father was alive and he died last October and, you know, it wasn't something that we were expecting. So, yeah. you know, to, um, to have that theme or that storyline um, in it, but all of those feelings end up being quite real. Um, and I just felt that with our world, I say this all the time um, and I've probably said it to you in interviews before, when I was a kid I'd read a book and I never found myself on the pages of that book yeah. Yeah. and when a child does that um when a child doesn't see themselves on the pages of a book if they don't see themselves in film and television they don't see themselves out there 
They actually don't think they're important. And then there'll be someone like you who does see yourself in the pages of a book, does see yourself in film and television. I'm not saying that this is you, but I think there has to be an element of you that, you know, subliminally thinks you're not more important, but that's what's happening, I think, with the idea. And I think that that's what's probably, you know, being said with the whole Black Lives Movement, um, Black Lives Matter. It's, you know, racism isn't just about calling names. It's about including, it's about excluding and the whole thing. So I just thought with this book, um, apart from Zola living with her mum and her nonna, um, you know, that seems real. And also her cousin lives behind her um, and my nephew's name's Harrison Alessandro. So we, I used Alessandro. By the end of this year, Bianca and Alice and Harrison are going to be sharing kind of a backyard um, because we're moving. Um, but I wanted Omar to live next door and I wanted Leo and his two mums to live on the other side because that's the reality of people's lives. And I'd love to think that some kid who's never seen themselves in a book or some kid who's never seen another culture in a book thinks, well, this is normal. And I think that presenting things as normal it's probably a step, you know, um, closer yeah, to, yeah. you know, and it's just, look, it's it's not kind of, um, it's it's hard because you would know as a writer, at the, for me at the beginning, it's all about entertaining. I, I don't think this is what I'm going to do in this book. I'm going to present this, this, this and that. But it just yeah. happens because it's yeah. your life. And, yeah. you know, when I think of that particular book, the first one, you know, it's really quite, um, it's really passionate about the environment. Um, yeah. and I'm not saying that that's not intentional, but my mother is passionate about her backyard um, yeah. and she does all the things that um, Zola's nonna does. She, you know, showers with a bucket. She'll, you know, her um, washing machine hose is linked to her garden. Yeah. Um, but the dog drives her crazy um, if the dog gets into her backyard as in ours. Um, it's just kind of the biggest deal. So all of that ends up being part of the story. Um, but it's great that at the same time it can also be a story about community gardens and then as a result of community gardens, obviously people get together to do it so they form communities. And yeah. I think, you know, it was a question that I was asked um, when you showed me the questions. For me, it's all I, I mean, I'm always going to be writing about community. They're just going to be different sorts of communities. All right, so should we get to some member questions? Because I can see our members are, are here and they're commenting and, um, you know, Beck Brown said she felt like that reading Ala Brandi and the whole, you know, sort of between Italian and Australian and trying to fit in. So people are obviously resonate. But we, I, I, I think we can honestly say that particularly with your, you know, the YA that you've written in the past, um, there's a definite resonance with Australia and I don't think that there's too many people um, who have not come across your work at some point, whether they came to it in those first, you know, when they're old, as old as I am, and they came to it in that first sort of go round, or because they've done it at school or whatever. Um, but we've got lots of questions from our members, and I asked you to choose two of your favourite questions uh, to receive. Um, each of these people will receive what well, they're going to get your book before you do, basically, I think is what we can say. Um, they'll be receiving copies <laughs> of these. Um, and the two winners of that, the first winner is uh, Bromman Colston. And uh, Bromman, Bromman's question was, you write across different genres and ages. Do you see a common thread in your work? Which was the question um, there. And you said that obviously community is one of those. Are there any other common threads that you see across your various things? You know, it's community and identity. Um, yeah. And, you know, I, I find that, you know, because I think that we're always grappling with our identity in this country. Um, and, you know, just what you were saying before about people's response to my work. You know, I, when I was younger and when people used to speak about my work, it was about the Italian-Australian experience. But I feel very passionately about the fact that my work is about the Australian experience. We don't have to have hyphens, you know, about yeah. it. It's about... It's the Australia that I kind of grew up with. Um, but whether I'm writing about Italians or not, in the Piper Sun I didn't, but that's about a community and it's about families and dysfunctional families um, and just what makes us tick. But, you know, for me it's about identity because I just, I've known all my life that I'm always trying to work out what my place is in this country. 
Um, and I think anyone is. And, you know, I was just saying this today because we were pitching something and I think I've said it, you know, so many times in interviews that, you know, when you think of how we feel about identity in this country, you've got someone like me who is the grandchild of migrants who came to this country and at one point in our lives have been told you don't belong here. And then, you and you know, firstly you have Aboriginal people who had it taken away from them and then you have Anglo or Irish uh, or Celtic people who are told, um, you know, you stole it. So all of us, I think, are grappling with what our place is in this country. And when I think of Italians, um, of lo not Italians today, but Italians of, you know, 30 years ago, they had such a strong sense of that country and who they were and the history that belonged to them. And now they're grappling with what, you know, we've been grappling for because they have such diversity now um, and they've got the multicultural um, element. But I remember, you know, visiting in there for the first time when I was 19, they had such a strong sense of this land belongs to us and this is, you know, we're connected to the stone and they're very, yeah. um, they were able to articulate it in a way that I wasn't able to do, so. Yeah. Okay, well, our second winner tonight, um, and we're going to jump forward a little bit with the questions here, is Hanadi Nasser. And Hanadi asks, looking for Alibrandi is an award-winning Australian lit classic. Did you feel pressure going into writing your second book? And if so, how did you overcome it? Um, oh, I took 11 years to overcome it. Um, I always <laughs> think it's... I think I could win the, um, the Guinness Book records for um, record for the longest between my first and second book, which was eleven years. Um, I I got asked every, and this is no exaggeration. I got asked every week of my life for eleven years when when my next novel was coming out or whether I was going to write a sequel. Um, and it was such a difficult it was such a difficult question because. I felt as if I didn't know what I had done. With that first book, you know, whenever I read a review that says it comes from the heart, of course there was a lot of editing, but it does feel as if it just came from there. And when I finished writing it um, and people would say, do it again, I just felt like saying, I just don't even know how I did it the first time. I didn't understand my craft. I think that was it. I understand my craft now and I started understanding what I could do when I started, you know, I wrote the film script and then Francesca. I really understood yeah. every decision I make when it comes to writing, I understand. But back then I didn't. I It just, it did come from the heart. And I think that that's why it took such a long time between books. I did try to write a book um, the year after. It failed. Um, I was told by my editor, just put it away, um, you <laughs> know. Cool. And it, yeah, it's just it's it's the hardest advice to get, mm. and I did put it away, and then I took it out again, and it was on the Jellico Road. So you know, and that's been one of my biggest, you know, maybe not numbers wise success, but it has been my biggest success internationally. So it was the best advice, but at the time I just thought, oh, my God, I can't, you know, it just broke my heart but it didn't work. And yeah. I realised 13 years later when I started that one that it had to be a bit of a different story, that the one thing that stayed the same was the main character, her name was Taylor Markham, and she lived, you know, off the Jellico Road and everything else seemed to be different, but I, I had that to start with and it, Back then, it was not my time to write that story. So, um, so it, sometimes it's about the right time to um, to write a story. And when I was, you know, when I was writing Saving Francesca, which was the second novel, um, I was working in a boys' school. I was just totally lost. I just thought, what am I doing here? I just don't understand boys. I come from a girls' world. I'm, you know, surrounded by 750 boys and men and I just, yeah, it was a nightmare. And when it stopped being a nightmare, I was very fascinated by their decency. They were such decent, um, you know, little human beings. I wouldn't call them little. Um, and that's where that story, you know, came from. I wanted to write about them, but I didn't want to write from a boy's point of view. I always say I didn't want to get into the the mind of a teenage boy. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> you know 
And I think that that's what we do as writers. We do what if, and I always do this really cruel thing. Um, I take something away from every one of my characters at the beginning. So with Josiella Brundy, I took away um, her, you know, the school that I went to. If if Josie went there, she would have ruled the school. So I took that away from her and I sent her to the other side of the city where she's totally out of her element. And in Francesca, I took her out of, you know, a familiar environment um, where her friends end up going to another school and her mum won't get out of bed one morning. So the two defining factors of her life are no longer there to define her. So then I sit back and watch her sink and I'm thinking at the same time because I know how it begins, know how it ends, have no idea how I'm going to get there. And that's where the journey um, starts. Um, oh. Yeah. But t- two chapters into that novel, no, three chapters into Saving Francesca, um, I just got a feeling that this was it. This was the second novel. Um, oh. And, you know, one of the interesting things, and I always say this to writing students, so if anyone out there is writing something, something about it wasn't working and, um, and, or, but I knew it was important. I knew her as a, she, you know, Francesca as a character, that all worked. Um, but I just changed the tense. I started from the beginning and I changed the tense and it just, I couldn't stop writing. So I thought, I can't believe that. Just one little thing like changing a tense can, Makes you know. Can, huge yeah. difference. Um, that so as well. that's, my, that's my advice to anyone. Change the tense or change it from first to third or third to first, you know. And um, you end up having a bit of a different tone to it, and 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 I haven't stopped writing actually since that novel. I I'm a bit tired at the moment because I feel as if I've written back to back. When I say back to back, you know, a book coming out every two or three years. Um, but I feel as if I've had characters in my head, you know, since 2003, and they drive me a bit crazy sometimes. <laughs> We can't have that now, can we? All right. Now, before we go on to the other questions, we do have one more opportunity to win uh, both of these books. Um, All you have to do to enter, if you are here watching us right now, is to tell us in the comments where you are watching from right now. Tell us where you are. If you want to get a little bit poetic and give us a little bit of backstory as to what you're doing, um, you know, whether you're folding the washing, whether you're playing the piano, whatever it is you're doing while you watch us, uh, tell us in the comments for your chance to win um, a set of the What Zola Did books. Um, Okay, now we are going to get into the questions, the the, the full-on member questions. I can see uh, several people who've asked questions are here, so uh, prepare yourselves, everyone. Brace yourself, Melina. Here we go. All right, so Wendy Cheek um, would like to know, she said, does Zola come from special memories you had as a child? And obviously, Um, We've discussed that with the inspiration being Bianca. Um, And she says Zola seems really connected to her community. Um, Is that how you're hoping um, that young readers will identify with her, with that connection to community? Yes, because I think, um, and gosh, especially now of all times, like I feel as if community is more important now than it's ever been in our lives. Um, you know, for me, and I, I mean, a lot of people know the history of my child coming into my life, but um, she came to live with me when she was two. And, you know, giving her a sense of um, place was just so important. And when I think of the bond that she has with, um, you know, with my family, it, it's just, it's what she needed in her life. I mean, it's just, I think it's what a lot of kids need. Um, and so, yeah, it's just one of those, um, it, it's just that idea that someone's got your back. I think that's it. And, yeah. and as these stories go, you know, she's going to have the, the kids next door on both sides, plus Alessandro, um, and it will build and build. You know, she'll end up being in a little, uh, my daughter plays the trombone. Um, <laughs> don't know why. Don't know. Don't even ask me why. Um, but she plays the trombone. She's only started this year. Um, and for anyone who's ever had a trombone player in the house, you know, it's it's not the type of musical instrument that you can just sing along to. Um, in the fourth book, which is my favourite and it's my um, publisher's um, favourite as well, um, you know, this the little neighbourhood, um, you know, come together with their um, band. They're all arguing about who's in charge. Um, but Every single thing I write about in these books, in the Zola books, 
are from something to do with our lives. You know, in the second book, uh, in the third book, you know, there'll be an incident where the um, Omar's dad has to chase the dog and that is something that happens. So every single book, something happens. And, you know, in the fifth book, which I haven't written yet, it's the Friday one, my father had bought a little boat and on a trailer and it sits outside their house and he wanted to fix it up, you know, because he wanted to take the kids out on a boat. So, um, and we're probably going to have to sell because um, it, you know, didn't get fixed up. But for oh. me, I just want, you know, to be able to write a story about the little yellow boat because yeah. it'll mean something to the kids. But more than anything, I'm thinking as a writer and, you know, the fun things you can do with paint and mischief and a dog yeah. and kids, you know. So yeah. it's all really stuff like that. And all of those are about community and people under, kids understanding that they're part of something bigger than just themselves. Okay, so um, Beck Brown has asked if, whether Zola is based on your childhood at all or maybe Josie Alabrandi. I guess my question would be like obviously uh, Bianca and, and your lives now do inform a lot of what, you, what you're writing about, but do you think that you have to draw on your feelings as a child and your experiences as well to get the right feel in the story? Not really, because I think of something like um, on the Jellico Road, and that was so far removed from my experience. You know, yeah. we were just such loved children to the point that we were suffocated, of course, you know, from that um, love. So, you know, every single thing that she goes through is something that's so alien to me. So, no, I, I don't think um, okay. you, but it's about everything's about the universal experience, and, you know, it, you know, just understanding, um, you know, love or alienation or all those things, we, we all go through that at some point. So that the emotions are easy to write about, the incidents are made up in, in a way. Um, and, and same with the, you know, with the Zola books, you know, a lot of the incidents are based on true things, um, but a lot aren't. So you're constantly building up on it. But that feeling Zola goes through a lot of experiences and you have to be careful, they're only six, but she does the wrong thing quite often and, you know, that is something that she has to come, you know, to understand. And in the book I was saying about the trombone, you know, she kind of, I wouldn't say she torments the old man living, um, you know, nearby, but she's quite rude, um, like she'll ring his doorbell and run away. So, and then, of course, she comes across him one day and he's playing the trombone and he ends up being the one who um, who kind of looks after these kids. But she's not a she's not a saint. Um, and, you know, it's it's good to kind of write someone who's as flawed as she is, because aren't we all like that? <laughs> Aren't we just? Um, so Emma Keeler asked, uh, what does Zola do on the weekends, which I guess we're going to find out about. Um, she also asked about why the change from YA to junior fiction, which I think we talked about with regards to, um, you know, the, the wish to kind of engage a reluctant reader, a very reluctant reader. Um, and Janet Arman wants to know what Zola does on Wednesday. Do we have to wait to find that out as well? <laughs> no, because I've written Monday to Thursday. On Wednesday, um, she gets it in her, the next door neighbor's dog. Um, the next door neighbor, Leo's mum, is a policewoman and she has a police dog. So Zola gets it in her head that she's going to train Gigi and Monty to um, find a friend's turtle, and it's chaotic, you know. Um, so there's that. My favorite, and I hope I end up doing this, but um, I'm just revisiting Ala Brundy for anyone. Um, who's interested, but on what Zola did on Saturday, I'm determined that that's going to be Tomato Day because oh, Tomato Day, <laughs> the red, you know, it's 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 always what's great colour-wise for the kids. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'm revisiting Tomato Day for, um, for Zola on Saturday um, yeah. and then on Sunday it'll be um, about the St Odo's fate, you know, so it's it's always based on things that have got, groups of people who are somehow connected to a community. 
Um, so Louise Brooks asks, what are the major differences slash challenges when writing for a young audience versus YA or adult literature? And I think we cover that a little bit in this with regards to, you know, the, the number of words and the ability. I, I, I find um, shorter very difficult um, myself and it's because I, I, you know, I've written 2,000 words before I've even got into the, you know, into the the end of the first act so to speak so when you're kind of like working through a 2,000 word story do you have to plan the structure of it very carefully or do you just write the story as you think it needs to be written and then edit it back to 2,000? Um, a bit of both a bit of both but um, I actually think that I need to reach the it's about 2,200 words yeah. Um, I, I find that in this case I'm not cutting down, I'm having to get to um, that. And I think it's because I'm just I'm sweating over every word um, more than anything. Um, it's, 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 I just find it hard. Like I, I just I can't get over how hard I find it. Um, it's such a short amount of time. So once I get it, you know, on a roll, I know what to do with it. But um, I just... I keep on saying, you know, it, it has to be as good as the first one. I think the first one's a very strong book. I don't yeah. want to get lazy about them and think, oh, you know, anyone's going to buy it. I'll just, um, that those seven books have to be as good as each other. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it, it's about having that standard. But, yeah, it's just, um, it goes back to that less is more. Like I, I find, look, I'm good at dialogue. That's one thing I've always been aware that I'm good at. Um, and dialogue is about spending hours trimming, working out the rhythm, you know, and that's what I'm doing constantly with, you know, these little books. So, um, yeah, just a challenge, a joy but a challenge to write them. Well, you know, it's good to have something to get your teeth into, right? Um, now I'm going to move on to your YA novels now and Sarah Whitmore has left you and I, I have forwarded you the entire comment. Um, you know, she wanted to let you know that, you know, she read Saving Francesca when she was about to turn 17. Um, she just started at a new school. She discovered, as we all do approximately that age, that, you know, old friends are possibly not really friends. Um, you know, she was fighting with her mum and she obviously saw herself, you know, in Francesca um, and it spoke volumes to her. And uh, like I read I read um, Sarah's comment, uh, which was gorgeous, like all the way through, and she basically just wanted to thank you for writing a story that resonated with her so much. And I would imagine um, it must be a, a, quite a joyous part of your life, but this must happen to you regularly. You must get this sort of comment from people regularly. Is that Would, would I be right about that? True, but I, when you read it from someone, you're reading them saying it for the first time. I distinctly yeah. remember read what you just um yes of course. Yeah. and I just you know to bring because it's just such a difficult age mm. any age is difficult um and I think that sense that you're not alone that you I think when you realize that you're not alone you know that you can get through it because someone else has got through it or is that feeling we have that we're the only people you know going through something so it does mean a lot like I've just uh, I, and I think deep down, um, I've always got favourites, but I, I think that Saving Francesca and that gang are my favourites. They're the most real to me. I, feel, I mean, I live in the area. I feel as if, you know, I can just see them out in the street. They just seem so real to me. Um, and, you know, reading that, you know, those words, it, it just, uh, it does bring such joy. And I, I've been told quite a few times at a um, at signing rooms by either the person themselves or their parent who's getting a book signed who'll come all the way to listen to me speak on their child's behalf and their yeah. child might be an adult living in London and they'll say, I need to get this signed because my daughter said I've got to come here and they'll say, you know, this has been said to me quite a few times that when someone's travelled overseas to work for a couple of years, as, you know, many do in their 20s, they bring one or two books and one of them's always Francesca or Al Brundy just to make them, you know, remind them of home. And that just, like, I don't what get... A you know, it's, an it's, an about that. it's just, it um, goes back to what I was saying, that I don't want my child to miss out on the solace that a book brings because, you know, yeah. even... Um, I don't know how you feel. Um, I can't 
get over how many books everyone gets to read, but I feel as if the casualty to my writing is reading and the yeah. casualty to my um, tiredness is, is reading. And interestingly enough, when we went into isolation, especially when the first kids were first stopped from going to school, you know, and I don't know, it was just, I don't know what kind of mode I was in, but I just started reading again. And um, my daughter was sleeping with me um, for the whole time, you know, and I just, I forgot just this, just the joy that reading just brought to me, you know, it just, and I think that that's the good thing about reading and your love of it. And I'm hoping that will happen, you know, with Bianca, that you don't forget, you might think, you know what, I don't read anymore. I haven't read for pleasure for ages. And then you will read for pleasure and you're on a roll, you know. So it, it comes back to you, that memory of what a book can do for you. And I'm not saying film and television doesn't. But I just think not like a book. It's just... Uh, it's just it's into it. Yeah. yeah. Um, it looks like Sarah, I, I, the, the, her name's not coming up here, but it looks like she's here with us and she says, thank you, thank you so much. I meant every word. So that's beautiful. Um, now, Christine Knight-Thomas wants to know whether there was a lot of pressure, like I know we talked about this where you were asked every week about where your second novel was and what you were going to do, et cetera, but was there a lot of pressure to write a sequel uh, for Looking for Ala Brandi? And how did you resist? Um, I'm still resisting. Um, no, I, I will never write a sequel to um, Ala Brandi. Um, it's funny because it comes up a lot with regards to film and television. Yeah. And I really, I, I won't go into it because it's just, you know, too tied up. But I have a feeling that I will succumb, um, you know, because I'm I'm being caught, like, what's the Wood. word? Wooed. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm very excited about the idea of an Ala Brundy um, short um, series, mm -hmm. like a series part mm -hmm. series. Um, and, you know, one of the things um, that I said was, um, you know, when I was speaking to them was it has to be a period piece. It has to be set in the 80s. Um, it has to be contained within that story. It cannot be you know, then we're going to have another season and she's going to go off and do whatever. It has to be that that it can't be, it can be changed within that story, yeah. but it's the begin and end where the, the book kind of begins and end in, ends in a way. Okay. So, um, yeah, so it's just, um, I don't know. It's not it's, the, no, there's going to be no sequel, but there may be a new story. Yeah, it's just, look, if there was a sequel, the grandmother would be dead. You know, I, I I find it really hard dealing with the fact that my father's even dead. You know, but you know, when when I wrote that book, apart from my grandfather um, who had died the year before, all my grandparents were alive. You know, so to write a, a Josie in the modern in, in the um, present day, um, I've done that. I've done it with Dalhousie. They're all you know, they're all Josies to a certain degree. You know, they're Although those women are a bit older, um, actually they're not. They're probably the same age as Josie Alabrandi would be, you know. Um, so I just think that I have written about them. I've written about her really as um, um, Mia Spinelli, who, you know, someone like Josie, her greatest punishment will be that she has a complacent child like Francesca. So I feel as if I have shown what that type of character grows up to be. Um, yeah. But I, I just, I'm just not interested in going there. First of all, because I've got so many other things I want to write, and Agreed. also, it just, I think it just worked. It was a, a, a story for that time, and it just worked. And I'm just going to leave it there, you know. So, okay, I think that sounds like a good and excellent plan. Um, Anna Lucia, um, Anna Lucia, it probably is Malta. Um, she asked if you'd ever wanted to write a companion novel to the book uh, with regard, you know, focusing on Josie's mum or grandmother. Um, you know, I guess maybe as you got older, did you ever think about what it was like to be Josie's mum? Well, once again, I did think, you know, it goes back to Mia Spinelli because when I, when I started writing Ella Brandi, I was a couple of years older than Josie. And when I started writing Francesca, I was a couple of years older than her mother, you know, Josie's mother, so in, in that way. But, you know, going back to when I was talking about the series, 
one of the things that I did say to them is if I ever go back into writing this for um, the screen again and not for film but for television, because you've got the opportunity in television to have longer yeah. pieces, you know, there's no way that I would not address the fact that at 17 these three women um, you know, grappled with choice. You know, one, you know, if we have to say one sent to the other side of the world to get married to a man or is married to a man, you know, the other one, you know, has a child or has to choose, you know, whether to have this child and then you've got someone like, Josie, who um, who has all the choice in the world and doesn't really know what to do. So I yeah. think that writing a, the series would give me an opportunity to flesh out these women. But yeah. once again, I just would want them to have happily ever after. So I'd be the worst person, you know, because I would want everything just packaged so nicely. I, I'd want, you know, Christina to end up with Michael Andretti, her first love, regardless of, you know, um that story and same with um Cartier so you've got to remove it from me so that I won't get all soppy about the story um yeah. you know I just feel as if I've left it in a way that it's up to the reader you know what they think happened to these characters and where they went um so Taryn Saunders wonders what it was like the process was like of having um Ala Brandy made into a movie um now, she says, how much control did you have over the movie script? You actually wrote the script, didn't you, and won an award for that. Am I right about that? Do I remember that correctly? Yes, it, it, it won quite a few awards that year. Um, you know, it's it, it's interesting because you, do have con you don't have control and you do have control. Um, yeah. The difference between a novel, the novel just belongs to me. Um, yeah. Whereas when you write a film script, and and even with what I'm writing now, because I, you know, I've we got Screen Australia money for Dalhousie, so we're de trying to develop that and sell it. So I wrote the pilot for that, and you know, anything that I've done with Jellico, what I'm aware of is it no longer belongs to you when you're part of a collaborative, you know, team. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, sticking as much as you can to the story, but it's still not your vision, just completely. No. Um, and you put as much as you can in the film script. Um, and I, I remember this with Ella Brundy. I remember being in a um, in a warehouse office where there was just the the me, the producer, and the director for so long. Like we were trying to get this right for, for years. And then I remember when it went into um, pre production, we had to change offices because we needed um, a place that you know housed the set design people and the costume design people and the you know all the different and I remember it was almost like a scene out of a movie walking down this corridor and people were poking their heads out saying hi introducing themselves and there was just so many people you know the the music and every all the different departments and I remember that moment thinking this is no longer mine and it was a good feeling because I felt that I trusted it was almost like okay. I was, you know, handed over because it's it's no longer yours. So you have to make sure that in the writing of that script and in the relationships that you have established with the producers, in the decisions you make, you know, saying yes to someone um, to, you know, adapt your work, you have to go in feeling really confident and secure that they're going to do the right thing by you because, you know, in the end, things are going to be different. I mean, anyone who's read the novel knows that the Josie of the novel and uh, and Pia are so different. I mean, they they both do justice to the story, but they're very different, you know. So you have to let go of a whole lot of things about what your perception of everything is. Taryn wants to know also, did you ever regret agreeing to the movie deal at any point? Like, was there ever a time where you thought, why am I doing this? No. No, um, I was worried and um, and my mother was just so, my mother would always say to me, you know, make sure they don't make the Italians look like, you know, fools, you know, because back then you didn't see a lot of, um, you didn't see depiction of um, Italians except, you know, in mob <laughs> situations or, you know, just, oh, oh, God, Bianca. Oh, you know? She's somewhere right. No, 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 that was rude. I had no, no ice no, cream. No, 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 that was rude. 
So off you I go. Have no, no ice cream. And I will talk to you about it later. Okay, stop. Sorry, she's just um. Mama Benji, I'm hungry. No, you're not going to have any ice cream. Um. Why? So there's the bowler. Um. This is the real yeah. life. Of um, yeah, it's like that as soon as you're on something, they come out with the food constantly yes. and it's like, no, no, no. Um, but yeah, I just I just remember that that pressure of just being so worried that they were going to um, just do something wrong with the, it's probably more the cultural stuff that really worries me. So um, that was a fear, but it was instantly Kate Woods who directed Ala Brundi, you know, she was always saying to me, I just need, you know, I was on board a lot with them because they were worried that culturally they'd get it wrong. So, you know, she even said to me, I want you to show me what a, a, an Italian grandmother's house looks like. And I took her to my grandmother's house and that's the house that was used in the film. So, you know, yeah. even though my grandparents have passed away and, you know, my dad has, I always think at least my family has um, that house in a feature film, you know, to remember um, and the yeah. memories of that. So, um, yeah, it's always it, it's always a fear that culturally someone's going to do something wrong um, with it yeah. because I, I, I don't think we've got a great track record in this country dealing with diversity on the screen. So, yeah. you know, you have to really make sure that um, that they're not using any stereotypes or they're not romanticizing the culture because that's another thing that people love to do. So, all right, switching gears slightly, we're just going to have we've got one question here about your adult novels. Um, Amanda Eve says, "I adored Tell the Truth, Shame the Devil," as did I, but hear very little about it. Um, do you find it hard to market yourself as an adult author? Um. It's not that I, I find it hard or my, not even because there was a lot of interest, you know, from the media. Um, it's just and I just don't ever want to be negative about the Ala Brundi experience because it was just a gift, you know. Um, yeah. But you write a book like Looking for Ala Brundi and it's all, you know, there, there's, there are either the people who have read all your books or the people who have read most of your books, they mightn't like, the fa they mightn't like writing, reading fantasy. Yeah. And then people who've just read one of your books and there's nothing wrong with that, but it's just Ala Brundi and that's where they placed you for the rest of your, you know, your your life. And, um, yeah, you know, I could say that there are moments if I want to, you know, especially with, um, with Tell the Truth, like I would like to have seen it out there a lot more in the crime world but I think it's just really hard for people to see me as something other than, you know, the person who wrote Looking Fella Brundy. Um, yeah. And it's a, I'm so, I mean, I'm so proud of Tell the Truth, Shame the Devil. And at the same time, it worries me once again on a cultural level because you are exploring, you know, um, another culture apart from, you know, Be Shortly. But, um, yeah, I just, I so... I felt so challenged doing that, but I so loved that character that going into that world, um, you know, was was wonderful. And, you know, it has a small um, readership, but it has such a passionate readership. You know, I just... I talk I, about it to people all the time. Like I will say here categorically right now, if you are a crime fan, it is a cracking read. And the reason I loved it so much was because it does have a strong young adult you know presence in the book and that young adult presence is so real that the whole thing gels beautifully like it's a it is a really good book so if you love a crime story out of all my novels it was it's the only one that's ever been reviewed in the new york times and they mentioned that exactly they they mentioned the the young people in it and i think that with my um with tell the truth especially with my young adult novels, I write about young people and the um, and the impact that adults have on their lives. And in Tell the Truth, I wrote about adults, but the impact that young people had, you know, on their lives. So it was just kind of it's it's point of view really. It's focusing more on you know a particular point of view. But um, you you know, it's a good question that I was asked there. You just can't get. I mean, you would know Alison as a writer. I mean, all of us deep down think, oh, geez, I wish I got a bit more attention. And I get a lot of attention. So, you know, I feel like a bit of a whinger. 
Um, but, you know, there's a part of me that thinks, gosh, if, you know, if a guy had written all the types of books I had, um, you know, written, they'd have a different profile, you know. Um, so there is this part of you that can get a bit hot and bothered and then you just get on with it and I have a passionate readership yep. and, you know, and they don't, books don't go away. Someone will, you know, pick it up at an, you know, it could just, you know, get another type of energy um, at another time. So um, I feel as if it's, you know, tell the truth is a evolving um, yeah. story and, you know, won't be forgotten. It's fine. Don't worry. We'll get there. I'll just keep telling everyone I've ever met about it and we'll get there. <laughs> Um, so just on that too, I've got a couple of questions here that are kind of writing related. One of them is about um, Amy Owers says, I love your strong female characters, which I think, you know, we've we've talked about that. She wondered if you base them on people that you know or yourself. And I feel like um, it sounds like it that you're drawing from a whole range of different um, different places, but, you know, within your community, within your family, within your um, areas to kind of create those strong female characters. Is there... Is there anything about the strong female character that that you that you look for when you're creating a character? No, because you know the the one thing that I try to do, um, it, and it's it's this lovely greediness. I'm glad I'm greedy. Um, you know, when I was writing Ella Brundy, I was writing about um, you know, I was saying before that I never saw myself on the pages of a book. Um, that's nothing compared to being a woman my age now because, you know, once you get a certain age, you disappear from books, you disappear from film. Um, so, you know, when I'm writing a book like um, Dalhousie, you know, I make sure that, you know, a, a woman my age doesn't get forgotten. Like she is, yeah. and same with, you know, um, The Piper's Son with Georgie Finch. You know, it was a different period in my life, but it was, you know, this is what that was what a 40 something year old woman, um, you know, was like. And this is what a 50 something year old woman's like. Um, so it's more about, um, you know, making sure that you just kind of don't disappear off the pages, you know, of anything because it's it's so easy to be forgotten. Um, so I feel as if I, I get my characters from that feeling and. You know, I think of Dalhousie especially where I think you get a certain to a certain age as I am now and men are still so important, of course, in, in your life and everything, but you just stop talking about men and I just, you realise that you've been talking about men since you were 12 years old and <laughs> I just find that the discussions now are, are just so robust and passionate and like I just love that uh, and it's not just people my age because, you know, because of the fact that I have a child who's young, um, a lot of people, you know, I'm hanging out with whether they're, you know, her um, friend's parents, we just have these really great conversations as opposed to the ones we were constantly having about boys and men and all of that. So it's it's those sort of conversations that I end up putting, you know, into my stories and, you know, sometimes if that makes those characters stronger, um, but my, incent my thing is not to write a strong female character. It's to write a real one, a flawed one. I mean, you know, I remember one of my sisters read The Piper's Son and she said to me, I'll never forget this, she rang me and she said, I wanted to slap Georgie Finch's face. Um, <laughs> Georgie's and I was just so stunned. And then I thought, I like the fact that you wanted to slap her face, you know. It was, just, it was just such a shock to hear that. But I thought, well, I touched a nerve. Like what was it about Georgie, you know, that, um, you know, that got on your nerves or, you know, women tend to be called difficult and all of these things. And they're the sort of things that I want to unpackage. Um, but it's more flawed women that I like writing. So if they come across strong in the end, you know, Absolutely. even when I think of, you know, family and I think of my grandmother, um, or especially my paternal grandmother, I mean, it, it seemed as if these women had no control over their lives, but they certainly had control over their families. So you, you're yeah. writing about, you know, that, that matriarch in the waiting, but they're, they're still kind of controlling things. 
Well, okay, well, I've got one last question before we wrap up, and it's from Polly McCauley. Uh, she had been in contact with Danielle Binks, who is a member in the group and is also an author and an, an agent, um, since the release of her book, and she told uh, Polly how much she looks up to you as an author and a friend. And I know there's a lot of authors out there that, that feel the same way. How does it feel to know that other Australian authors look up to you so much and are actually inspired to continue writing by you? Like, you're still doing it, Melina, you're there. Um, she's not going away. <laughs> going to be a 92-year-old woman riding in my nursing home. Um, you know, it, I, I feel as, you know, what you've got to offer, and it's not about age, um, but it is about age as well. You know, I've been doing this for 28 years. Um, I, I used to be the go-to person. You know, once in a while I'd get an email from a writer saying, well, so-and-so told me to speak to you because, you know, you know something about fighting the Americans about editing or things like that. You know, the Americans were actually great at editing, so I didn't even want to say that. But I was good at that because I would say to them, don't change a word. They'll still publish it, you know. Um, yeah. And it, that comes with experience. That comes with the experience of knowing that even at my meekest, because um, I've got stronger over the years, I mean, but I was, I could hardly even string a, a, a you know, sentence together. I was so shy when um, Ala Brundy first came out. But I remember even getting interest from, you know, people overseas and they wanted to change everything. And I would write a really long, polite letter um, justifying why it shouldn't be changed. And they'd say, okay, and it would get published the way it was. So that was something that I was able to pass on to, um, yeah. you know, younger or newer writer because it's not just about being young. It's about being, you know, frightened of you know, saying something because they won't publish it. So if I've got that to offer a, um, you know, a writer um, who's coming up through the ranks or whatever it's called, it's because I've had that experience and you want, you know, I remember, look, I, I always say this, I remember being at university, my novel came out, I failed my first English essay, King Lear, um, that week and three weeks later, I received back in the day where people received mail, I received a letter, um, you know, via, 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 and it was from John Marston. And I will never forget that because I, I remember we were studying um, one of his books at university. It was so much to tell you. And it was just, you know, that and another person was Isabel Carmody. I just yeah. remember in those early days them looking out for me and yeah. I just you know, I feel very strongly about that, that we are kind of anyone, who, you're not going to be um, patronising about it, but I just remember it happened to me and I would like to be able to pass that on. And I think the best compliment for me and, you know, Danielle's just, she always supports my writing so beautifully and she writes such amazing reviews, not just because they're great reviews, but she really knows how to deconstruct um, a text. Um yeah. But one of the, the best compliments for me comes really from people like, you know, um, Randa, who's from a, um, you know, she's an Australian Muslim writer or just people who have read Ala Brundi from a different culture and thought, you know what, if she can do it, I can do it about, I can write about mine. And when yeah. I read it, they read Ala Brundi and thought, this is why I want to write my book. That to me is such a compliment because, um, you know, you want to have given someone the confidence that maybe I didn't have when I was younger, you know, when I was reading books. So um, so it's very complimentary, but they're as just as supportive um, to me as I am to them. So it's not as if it's a one-way, you know, um, kind of, yeah, it's, it's, and you would know that from the industry. It's a very, I would say it's a very, like, I find it's the Australian children's scene particularly um, incredibly supportive. A, there's a lot of incredibly generous um, Australian authors out there who are, you know, who are further along or not quite as far along or wherever they are, um, all supporting each other. And, and, and I think it's a, it's a wonderful thing to be part of. I'm really proud to be part well, of it. And what you said. It's it's exactly what you said because I'm not I don't know enough of the adult world or and I've written as many you know sometimes um, adult novels but it's the children's and the YA um, writers who I just find are so supportive and they're lovely and 
you know, if someone's got an ego, big deal. I mean, there's worse things in life than an ego. And why can't we have an ego? You know, it's almost oh, like someone else has an ego, but we can't, you know, because we write for kids or young adults. So, um, so yeah, I just find it's a really um, lovely community to be part of and a very supportive one. And it should be. It, I think any industry should be. I, I can't handle any sort of arrogance or pretense in any industry because I don't believe anyone's better than anyone, you know. Um, and if you've got someone to something to offer someone as a writer or as in anything, then you know, take it on board. But um, but yeah, lovely Daniel. Thank you for that comment because um, you know, it is it's it's always lovely to hear that from another writer. Well, we love having you as part of it and we have loved having you as part of our live event tonight, remembering that we started out talking about the new books, which, of course, are what Zola did on Monday, what Zola did on Tuesday, and I have chosen a winner for our third set um, because I think that Melina and I can both relate to this. I can't see the name. I'll have to check the comments. But if this is your comment that you are watching from Sleepy Old Hobart and you are hiding from the kids in a wardrobe, then we can both relate to that and you have won yourself a set of books. So thank you so much for your time thank tonight. Anna. It's been a wonderful experience. I'm sure that everybody in the group is very thrilled that you've been um, able to join us here tonight. And best of luck with all of the Zolas. We, we will look forward to following her adventures. And I do hope that she gets her ice cream now. Oh, I don't know. After that, I don't think she will. Um, thanks, everyone, and just take care of yourselves and we'll get through this. It's just driving us crazy. But, yeah, um, anyway, lovely. Thank you so much.